first one being um, the induced hypothermia or right. targeted temperature management, whatever it's going to be. Um, so there's some changes to that as well. Yeah. And 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 I'll kick it off by saying, uh, previously we had to wait a certain amount of time while somebody had ROSC and then start the chilled saline. So that part is what's changed, right? Yeah, that's changed. It now basically says just start it. And you know, I think that was just more of a practical change, yeah. right? I mean, we wanted we wanted them to be stable, somewhat stable, but it turns out that, you know, you, either the patient codes again or they don't. Exactly. You get them moving and then, you know, as you're doing your kind of secondary mm -hmm. stuff, mm -hmm. um, it, it, it wasn't really affecting effective to wait that time. And I sure. think it created an artificial barrier. Yeah, I So think people right. were so focused on that time thing. Right. So we just took it out. Uh, you know, your post ROSC stuff, you know, your 12 lead is still gonna be super important and we want that emphasized. Yep. And then I think the other thing that's important is that we're still doing induced hypothermia. Yeah. Uh, although the language is kind of backed off a little bit this time, it's sort of had a, more of a consideration. Um, we're still doing it pre-hospitally here. And uh, you know, there's been some, there was a data out of Seattle mm -hmm. that showed that potentially there was no difference in outcome, whether it was started in the field or not. Right. What I think is really important is that um, we felt since the beginning here that we were um, we were the ones sort of pushing the hypothermia. Yeah. Right? Clearly hypothermia or TTM improves outcome. Maybe it doesn't matter whether you started in the field or, or as soon as they get in the emergency right. department. But we do know is that if we started in the field, they're more likely to get it, or at least what we feel. Yeah. So they're more likely to get it once they get to the hospital. And that's why we continue to do TTM, or start the hypothermia here okay. in the system. Perfect. Yeah. Um, and then the age as well. Right, so we, I think the old, and I, I think it was like 18 on the old yeah, one, and now, so. and now we've gone to 13. Okay. And that's just because there's the data. Yeah, we're it, getting more info. Exactly, and, and you know, there's still, it's still up for debate. Some of our PED centers are doing uh, TTM, mm -hmm. uh, or, or hypothermia on all patients, some on some patients, so there's still a lot of discussion around PED. So we, we discussed whether or not to do it on every post Ross yeah. and decided not to go uh, to below 13. Okay, cool. Okay, another protocol that's got some significant changes is our shock protocol. There you go. Right, and um, and uh, specifically, there's there's a new line in our protocols that talks about adrenal insufficiency. So maybe we can talk real quick. Sure. You know, 30 second blurb is of what is this and who might we see it and what are we going to do about it when we see it? Yeah. So I mean, there are a couple changes in the shock protocol, but that that's, yeah, well, that's that, the first piece. Yeah. yeah. So your your adrenal gland releases steroids. Mm -hmm. Steroids are a key component of, of support for pressors. So if you are steroid deficient, um, pressors won't work. Mm. And, and so the patients, there are patients out there who are steroid deficient. Um, and so if they, go, if they go into shock, using fluids and press, pressors just, may just not be enough. May not be enough. And so those, since steroids come out of the adrenal gland, that's called adrenal insufficiency. Makes perfect sense. Yeah, and there's sort of two populations. The one that's really gotten a lot of sort of grassroots campaign and press about are people who are diagnosed with adrenal insufficiency. That their adrenal gl gland makes no, Nothing. no yeah. doesn't make any um, any of these steroids, mm -hmm. these uh, glucocortico, these corticosteroids. Uh, so on those patients, if you have a patient, they've got a wristband that says adrenal insufficiency or they tell you they have adrenal insufficiency or that sort of thing. There's mm -hmm. kind of two options. The protocol calls for using dexamethasone, okay. which is which is actually not the best right, but it's, corticoid, but it's something. But it's something, and it will definitely provide support so so that that the shock will improve. Um, so using 10.6 milligram per kilogram of dex for those patients who are in shock mm -hmm. who have known diagnosed adrenal insufficiency. The other thing you may run into is that they have their home kit. They have their own medication. Right. So the home kit is Solucortef. That's the brand name, but it's it's hydrocortisone. Okay. Um, this home kit, um, a lot of them they carry it. That some families can deliver it themselves. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the families are trained, but a lot of times, you know, you see with this kind of stuff, my kid's sick. I'm much too worried about that uh, than um, than they don't deliver it, right. or it's a school situation. Right. So the medication's at the school, but uh, the school nurse isn't there, and the, so there's not anyone who can deliver. Right. So in, in Clackamas and in Washington counties, 
you know, the, if you come across that situation, you can deliver that medication. So you can use the home kit of the hydrocortisone, okay. the solucortef. Uh, practice your five or six R's, right. make sure it's not expired mm -hmm. and all that. But ultimately you are able to follow the directions on the kit and deliver their, their yeah. home medication. And, and the, and the um, uh, adrenal insufficiency can be a life-threatening emergency, right? Absolutely, because I mean, if you've got shock, and you're not responsive, yeah. you need the support of the, of, the, For sure. of the steroids. The other group of patients where you want to consider adrenal insufficiency in is people who are on lifelong or long-term steroids. COPD patients. Yeah, so if you've got a COPD patient who's septic and their, their mean arterial pressure is oh, 55, well, yeah, we'll we're going to get, get there. That. Yeah, yeah. So they're, and you're fluiding them up and they're not getting any better and you're thinking about epinephrine and you look through their list and they take 40 of prednisone every day. Mm -hmm. They are, they have an induced adrenal insufficiency. They've taken this prednisone, so their adrenal gland says, well, if you're gonna take prednisone, yeah. I'm Forget gonna take it. the I'm week out. off, yeah. I'm out. And so their adrenal doesn't make the <laughs> steroids and then you take away the exogenous steroids, they become adrenal insufficient. So that's another group where you could consider shock patients not responding they are on high dose steroids chronically, you could give them an IV dose of dexamethasone. Now we don't want to blanket give dexamethasone to right. shock patients. There's right. actually a recent study came out that showed that that might not be good. Mm. But if you known AI, absolutely. Um, presumed AI because of history, you could certainly consider it. Sure, awesome, good deal. Okay. Oh, mean sorry. pressure. Yeah, mean pressure. Let's talk about that. So yeah. um, it's it's been one of those things that's uh, been right in front of our eyes uh, for, for many years. And some of you are probably familiar with that. Um, but we're going to start looking at mean arterial, arterial, you can never say it the first time, pressure right. uh, in certain patients yep. versus their systolic pressure. Uh, so maybe uh, a little bit of why, why, what's the map and why is that good? And maybe what's the difference between a measured map and one that's just been calculated for you? So maybe those are some good things we can talk about. Well, so what's the definition of shock? Really, what is shock? It's a, uh, you have, uh, your organs are not being perfused. Bingo. So you are looking, I think yeah, it's a good thing you got that I right. I know, right? right so, so, um, so there's not perfusion to the organs. So what the, the most accurate measure of perfusion to the organ is in fact MAP. Because when you think about, you got a big pipe and then a smaller pipe mm -hmm. and then a smaller pipe and then capillaries, by the time you get blood flow at the organ level, this microcirculation, it's not pulsatile. So the systolic isn't driving it. It's the mean pressure that's driving flow at the organ level. So, not Oregon, but right. Oregon. Um, so the map is the most accurate way okay. to identify um, the flow at the organ level, which is what we're trying to improve when we improve shock, is flow to the organs. Okay. So we've added the mean arterial pressure to our shock and to a number of other protocols so that, um, so that as a guideline. And basically, we're shooting for a map of greater than 65. Okay. Now, interestingly, the map is not uh, it's not. It's never measured because we don't. We can't put a little device right. at that microcirculation level. So it's actually calculated. Okay. But our monitors do that for do us. Do they really? They do. It's so, amazing. So, so no math. So there is a way to calculate math We're, manually, and that involves math and, div yes. and division and dividing by threes and all these things. <coughs> and and we're moving to a ma math free paramedic experience. Oh, I love it. It's like, it's like common court. No, it's just kidding. All right. So if, you if, you, if you're looking at the screen right now, what you'll see is you'll see uh, three of our most common monitors. We got the Zoll X series, we got the Philips MRX and the LifePak 15. And you can see that uh, you have, we'll use the Zoll for example. So 121 over 79 is our blood pressure. Right. Uh, as measured, measured by as the machine. Measured. Yep. And then you can see uh, where the arrow's at is you have a number uh, that's in uh, parentheses and that is 96. So what basically the monitor has done for you is taken the uh, the systolic divided by the divided by the and then yeah. you came up with this number right here. So um, so why 65? Why a map of 65? Is that significant for? Does that equal somehow a cerebral perfusion pressure? Does it like? I mean, when we talked end organ, I'm, I know the brain's included in that, but. Yeah, you know, actually it's funny is that there is some controversy about what the best map, map is. is. 
But in general, it's accepted that you need a map of 65 or greater to perfuse your organs. Okay. There are some people who argue that older patients need a higher map. There's also some argument that patients who are in shock from sepsis may need a higher map. But right now, the sepsis guidelines, mm -hmm. the national, uh, sh say that you should shoot for a map greater than 65. Okay. Now, we are still using systolic blood pressure in the head injury stuff. Sure. And so that, I mean, you brought that up, mm -hmm. brain perfusion. So we still don't, you know, we still want to make sure our systolic doesn't drop below 90 in our head injured patients. So we're, we haven't, we haven't gone map completely map, and that's because the most recent set of data on head injury stuff still uses systolic stuff. Trying to be as evidence-driven as we Absolutely. can. Absolutely. But uh, the idea is thinking at the sort of most physiologic level, which is map rather than systolic and, or diastolic. Cool. Awesome. All right. So uh, last subject for us, crush injury. So right. um, uh, there was super busy discussion at the protocol development committee. Over um, multiple like meetings. Over multiple meetings uh, uh, in updating the crush protocol. So um, why don't we talk a little bit about um, hyperkalemia and, uh, you know, the addition of a tourniquet and all these kind of things. So. Uh, Let's, let's just start with that. Yeah, so, so remember that when you, when you measure potassium in the blood, you're actually measuring only about like 1% of the body's total potassium. Okay. The majority of potassium lives inside the cells, and it lives in muscle cells in particular. So when you have a person who has a crush where there is a lack of blood flow because mm -hmm. there's pressure on right. the extremity for a length of time and part of the problem is I don't know what that length of time is. Yeah. I don't know if it's five minutes and I don't, or two hours. I don't think hours. it's just you that no one nobody really else. knows, right? Right, right. Yeah. Well, if I don't know it, nobody well, knows. Well, that's true. Right? I so, forgot about yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. All know. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. yeah any, <laughs> anyway, so, so when you remove that crushed object, all of the stuff inside the cells now is extracellular and rushes back. And so, and that includes a ton of potassium. And what do we know about potassium? If you push potassium fast, dead, dead, yeah. right? So that's medical. That yeah, that's yeah. my medical. Yeah, that's yeah, good. Well, it's yeah. good. Yeah. You know, you training speak fire officer. ease yeah. training <laughs> officer. So, um, so yeah. So the idea with the crush protocol is to try to anticipate that elevated potassium as a risk. So there are a couple of things that are added to the protocol. One is this sort of consideration of using a tourniquet. So if you have somebody with a significant, who you think has a significant crush injury with some period of time, and I don't, I can't tell you what right. it is. I can't tell you that it's like two minutes or five, five hours. hours. It's not two minutes. Yeah. I will yeah. tell you that. Yeah. Yeah. But if you are concerned about crush injury, when you remove the object from the person, one of the things you can do is place a tourniquet on the patient. And the idea is to prevent that, that potassium rush. to rush, rushing back. Yeah. Um, so that's a possibility. It is a consider. It is not like a mandatory thing. Mm -hmm. And then the other piece to the protocol is basically a ref reference to the hyperkalemia protocol. But what I, what I want you to take from this is I, when you've got a crush patient, I want you to think hyperkalemia, let's get ready. Yeah. Okay, so if you start to see peaked T waves as you remove the stuff, um, that's where you're going to um, consider the treatments that we have. For, yeah. Calcium, Calcium, bicarb, bicarb. Uh, being the main. Uh, albuterol, mm -hmm. throw them on a nebulizer, that'll you know lower their potassium. Um, now, we're not doing prophylactic bicarb. Some places in the country do prophylactic. So while the patient's trapped or whatever, they'll even they get that line started give it to them as they're bringing them out, the whole nine yards. Right, yeah, so yeah. we're not doing that. Yeah. We are doing fluids. Of course. So, so if you have a patient who you think has a significant crush, you know, bolus them up before you remove the item, but, and then have your calcium, your albuterol, have all that stuff out. Make sure they're on the monitor if you can do yeah. it. So if you, can, if you see the T waves start to peak, or you start getting some dysrhythmia as you start treating them for hyperkalemia. Awesome, cool. Well, um, I think barring that. I think that's it. I think we covered it all. Great to see you again it's as great usual. Great to see you, man. And we'll see you around. You guys take care. And again, any questions, you can always ask your medical director <laughs> or see your EMS training officer, okay? Thanks.